Hello, friends, and welcome to the next lesson in the God Cares For You Bible study. I would like to begin with a word of prayer, and my prayer is very similar to the song that you just heard in the introduction, that we would walk closer to the Lord Jesus. He promised that he would help us get to that place of nearness to him. So let's bow our hearts and pray. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you for the privilege that we have to hear the word of God, the wonderful words of life that come from you. Lord Jesus, we welcome you into our hearts, our thoughts, our journey in this world. And we pray your kingdom come and your will be done in us and through us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, I'd like to begin with a few songs. The first song that I want to sing is Near to the Heart of God. Near to the Heart of God. What a great reminder in that song that there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. And that's the place where he wants us to be, near to his heart. Let's sing another song, In the Garden.
Yes, he walks with us and talks with us because Jesus is not a religion. He's a living, loving, merciful, kind, compassionate Savior who walks and talks with us today, assuring us that we belong to him. Is that not an amazing gift that we have? So friends, I want to begin on this message with you. We're going to be in sharing a lesson two handout, Hope in the Good Shepherd. And that will be the scripture portions that we're going to be using today. And what we're going to do is we're going to focus once again on the topic of hope. Now, all people need hope. In fact, no one can live without it. But hope that's placed in future circumstances, people's behavior or decisions, our health, our finances, these can all take a turn for the worst, leaving us unfulfilled, leaving us without hope. You see, we all have desires and hopes, and many of them are good, but not all of them are guaranteed. This is what one lady named Mary experienced. She had a lot of hopes and plans for her life. Well, let me tell you her story. You see, Mary, when the chaplain met her, she had no hope. She said she felt as if her soul had died. The past year had brought unimaginable heartbreak to this 75-year-old woman. You see, her husband of 54 years had died suddenly of a heart attack. And shortly before his death, their daughter and granddaughter had been tragically killed in an automobile accident. And not long after her husband's death, Mary suffered a severe stroke that required three months of rehabilitation in a care center. It was during that time that her son sold her home without her consent and then stopped visiting her altogether. Understandably, these events took a dreadful toll on Mary. She withdrew into a long and lonely season of despair. Now, Mary was a Christian, but would you say that Mary's hopelessness was reasonable? I certainly understand why Mary was experiencing hopelessness. So we ask questions like, why would God allow such tragedy in this woman's life? Did he forsake her in her later years? Perhaps you have a story too, a story of loss, tragedy, brokenheartedness, Perhaps you've had your hopes and dreams dashed against the rocks of ill health or rocky relationships or financial hardship or widowhood. When all our hopes are geared only towards what we might experience in this world, we actually deny ourselves the greater blessings that our Creator has intended for us. You see, it's not that God isn't concerned about what happens in our lives on this earth. Rather, he's concerned for the whole package, life on earth and life beyond earth, eternal life. In our previous video lesson, we shared how we can put our hope in the Lord. And what we said was that we consider what our hopes and desires are and we seek the Bible. What does God say in the Bible about our hopes and desires? And if we can align our desires and hopes with His will and His plan, then we can have confidence to ask Him to fulfill those desires and hopes. But if our desires and hopes do not align with His will and His plan, then we need to adjust and change. And when we do that, we will find the blessings of God. Now, when we look to the Lord to learn what he says about our desires, we learn that he's concerned about the bigger picture. Remember this always, that Jesus loves us so much that he made a way for us to live with him in heaven. Heaven is different than earth. Eternity in heaven with Jesus is peace and beauty beyond our imagination. And it was no small undertaking for Jesus to make this possible. It cost him his life, his very life. 
Yes, our eternal hope was procured by the lifeblood of Jesus. Now, his intent is not so much that we would have our best life right now. It's that our best life starts now and lasts with him for all eternity. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is a rich and satisfying life that's forever. So this fulfilled life, it, it will start now, but it is not completely fulfilled until we are in heaven. And so as we are presenting our desires and needs and hopes and dreams before the Lord, he's thinking of this bigger picture. What does this mean, not only today, but a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, a million years from now? And so sometimes our hopes and desires are delayed so that God can align us for the bigger picture. And sometimes our desires and hopes are so contrary to what God wants to do in our lives that his answer is no. So what can we hope for today while we're in this world? What are some of the promises that Jesus has given us that will bring us to the abundant and fulfilled life that he promised? I'd like for you to take your paper and look with me at this famous psalm, Psalm number 23. Most of us have heard this psalm before, but I want to unpack some of the amazing treasures that are in here. So if you take your paper and let's look at the top, verse number one, let's look at several promises that Jesus has made. Now I've written this out in a modern translation so that we might better understand some of these promises. And there are over a dozen promises in this psalm. So let's read this together, all right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, friends, in this psalm, there are several promises of God. I wonder if you've recognized any. Now, yes, they're in a metaphorical or some symbolic uh, perspective, but they hold absolute truth that are hidden under the surface of what God is saying. Let's look at these verses and, and see um, what some of the promises are. Okay? So first, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. The first promise is, I shall not want. That speaks of provision. You see, the Lord is our provider, and he fulfills our needs. And because of that, I can become content because I lack no th good thing. It says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Now, this speaks of rest for our soul, rest from the burdens of life. And rest is a place of peace and security. It's not necessarily environmental peace, but it's internal peace that regardless of the circumstances around me and the environment around me, I can have peace in my soul. He says, he leads me beside the still waters. Now this speaks of refreshment. I want you to think of a cool drink of water to quench your thirst, your thirsty soul. The water that Jesus gives truly quenches our thirst. It's water from heaven, and it quenches the thirst of our soul. And because we have these blessings, the next verse says, He restores my soul. 
And this speaks of healing, the healing of a broken heart, a new or fresh grip on life, gladness of heart. That's the restoration that Jesus gives us. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This speaks of guidance on the path to living an honorable life, a life that reflects the love and goodness of God. You see, like the moon reflects the sun, the Lord wants to shine his light in this world through his children. And that's what he will do when he's our shepherd. Then the next verse, number four, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, friends, this speaks of confidence in the midst of loss, danger, and even death. And a lot of people look at this psalm and they hear this part and they think this is only about physical death. And this promise does include God's presence and grace when someone is dying. Yet the valley spoken of here also speaks of a death to things that are important to us. Things we possess, hopes and dreams in our hearts, situations, and even people that we love and who were significant to us. Even though we have to let go of some of these things, things we love and desire and long for, we fear no evil. Why? Because the next verse, or the next part of that verse says, For you are with me. Now friends, God is with us through the valleys, through the losses and changes that are such a struggle. In the times of hopelessness, God is still reaching out his hand to us to be with us. So it says here, For you are with me. And this speaks of the continual presence of our good shepherd. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. You see, we can have confidence that he has good plans for his sheep. My good shepherd has promised that all things will work for my good because he is good. The next part of that verse says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now this speaks of two things, friends. Protection and also discipline or training up. Training one up. The, the, the Lord's rod and staff are tools to do two things. When I need correction and discipline, my wise shepherd knows how to handle me with loving firmness. The scripture tells us to consider hardship as discipline because God is treating us as his children whom he loves. And no discipline is pleasant at the time when it comes, but later it produces many great benefits. So the Lord's rod and staff, they are used to discipline us and train us up, but they are also used to protect us. Always remember that my enemies are first my good shepherd's enemies. Listen to what this says in John chapter 10. Now this is not on your paper, but it says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You see friends, whatever it takes, whatever is necessary, Jesus will protect his sheep. So the rod of our good shepherd is fierce and he knows how and when it is best to use it. The next verse, number five, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Now friends, when you think of a table and being at the table, this is a place of fellowship and the Lord prepares a table for us, a place of fellowship with him. And we are invited to a feast in his goodness, even as our enemies are near. The next part of that verse says, you anoint my head with oil. Now this speaks of God-given purpose that is significant. You see, the Lord reveals our purpose and anoints us to fulfill our purpose. The anointing is 
a setting apart for God's work in this world. And God gives us his Holy Spirit so we can know him, love him, and serve him. And in the midst of that, we're actually fulfilling the very purpose for which he created and ordained for us to fulfill. Friends, there's no greater fulfillment than knowing that I have fulfilled the purpose of God. Do you know that Jesus, even when he spoke his last words on the cross, it is finished. He said that because even for Jesus, it was important for him to acknowledge that he fulfilled the purposes that God had for him in this world. The next part of that verse 5 says, My cup runs over. This speaks of satisfaction. Friends, the followers of Jesus have joy and contentment and confidence because they know they belong to the Good Shepherd. Their lives spill over into other people's lives because the goodness of God spills out of us to those around us. And finally, in verse number six, it says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Now this speaks of our impact in this world. Because of the goodness and love of the Lord in our lives, goodness and love are the aroma we leave wherever we go. The Apostle Paul spoke of this as the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are things that come from the Spirit of God working in and through us. We become people that this, I like to say, this leaks out of us because that's who we are, because of the goodness of our Good Shepherd. You see, even after I leave this world, the good and love of God will be my legacy. Oh, what good God has in store for us. And finally, the last part of the verse says, And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, friends, this speaks of our future. Not only this 80, 90, 100 years we might live, but for all eternity the relationship with our Good Shepherd does not end when our bodies wear out. We are sons and daughters of the eternal God who has prepared a place for us in his house. That's what Jesus promised. I go and prepare a place for you. These are things that every human being longs for and desires. And God knew that when he created us. And he makes the things that we were created to desire and hope for. He makes them possible. But friends, we have to realize that we need to go His way. Think about it. All these promises of provision and rest for our weary and burdensome soul, refreshment and healing of our broken hearts, guidance on a path that leads us into an honorable life, confidence, protection, and also discipline, satisfaction in purpose, everlasting fellowship with the Lord. All these are ours under one condition. This whole psalm is contingent on one phrase at the very top. What does it say, the very first phrase at the top of this psalm? It says, the Lord is my shepherd. So if you see towards the bottom of your page, it says here, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. It's Jesus, the shepherd, that we're talking about in Psalm 23, a psalm that was written hundreds of years before he ever came to this earth as a baby and grew into the man whom we know as the Good Shepherd. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, 
Who is my shepherd? Do I have a shepherd? Is Jesus the shepherd of my life? Is he the shepherd of your life? If he is, let's say this together out loud so that everyone can hear us. Let's say, the Lord Jesus is my shepherd. Let's say that together. The Lord Jesus is my shepherd. Never be ashamed to proclaim that wonderful truth. He gave his life that he could be our shepherd. So let us be willing to give our voice in praise and gratitude. Let's say that again together. The Lord Jesus is my shepherd. You see, we must realize that this life is a journey that is fulfilled only through faith and hope in Jesus. I want you to see now, if we can go back to the story about Mary, what happened in her life. Now Mary, I explained, she was a believer, she was a Christian. She believed in Jesus, but she was dying inside because of all the painful losses she experienced. You see, at that time, she was not, in that moment of time, she was not realizing all the promises of Psalm 23 that our Good Shepherd Jesus gave us. But after several weeks of a friend sharing scripture with her and praying about what God said, regarding her hopes and desires, reading the Bible and praying, Mary began to truly realize that amidst her great losses, that the Good Shepherd was reaching out to comfort her. So instead of running from him and saying, why would God do this? Mary began to run toward him. She found assurance that Jesus loved her and that there was much good still in store for her. You see, Mary's faith was reignited. The Lord restored her soul. He renewed her strength. Her despair was transformed into hope, and she started eating and actually even started to visit other residents around the home. You see, her hopelessness and doom became light and confidence in the Lord. And because of Mary's emotional healing, Mary was able to help other residents find the same kind of hope that she found that helped her overcome her darkness. What was so different for Mary? You know, she still had the great losses and unpleasant circumstances. That did not change. But now she also had a glimpse of the bigger picture. She could see how her losses, though painful, were temporary. Mary's painful journey ultimately led her closer to Jesus, her Good Shepherd, the Good Shepherd whom her loved ones were with and who with him were waiting for her when her journey was done. You see, Mary could see that Jesus' his good plans for her and also for her loved ones are eternal, that they weren't only temporary. Yes, again, there is still pain and there is still a, a, a longing to be with him, with the, her loved ones and with the Lord, but she had hope and confidence because the Good Shepherd spoke to her and promised her that he had good in store for her and for them. And this is what you, this is what Jesus wants you and I to experience today. Let's sing a song that is actually a prayer. The song is called Savior Like a Shepherd. Let's sing that. Thank you.
What a great prayer in that song. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Let's say this together again. The Lord Jesus is my shepherd. Let's say that. The Lord Jesus is my shepherd. It's a great proclamation. And as we go through times of struggle and challenge, and our hope is being torn, we can stop and say, wait, the Lord Jesus is my shepherd, and begin to quote what he says in the Bible about my situation. You see, in this journey on earth, Jesus writes the last chapter. It looks like the last chapter here, but it's not the last chapter of our existence because it opens up, the next chapter opens up to eternity with Him. So friends, I'd like to encourage you and even challenge you to spend the next week or so reading this Psalm 23 and evaluating your hopes. Perhaps you will need to redirect some of your hopes and dreams from the things that are limited and temporary to the one who loves us and gave his life to assure us a fulfilled and satisfied life for now and also for eternity. As we begin to conclude, I'd like us to look at the prayer on the bottom of your paper. I'd like to read this first, and if you think it's a good prayer, we can all pray this together. It says, Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your loving care given to us through Jesus, our Good Shepherd. My hope is in you, Lord Jesus, because you love me and you are faithful. Is that a good prayer? Can we pray this together? Let's do that. Let's all pray this out loud. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your loving care given to us through Jesus, our Good Shepherd. My hope is in you, Lord Jesus, because you love me and you are faithful. Amen. Amen. In closing, I want to share a final word with you. Today, while I was preparing for this message, this word came to my heart and mind. And so I think it's, it's pertinent for all of us. I believe the Lord is saying this, do not seek only for what Jesus will do for you. Seek Jesus for who and what he is. All the good that Jesus does for his sheep is because of who and what he is. He is the Good Shepherd. He loves his sheep, and he wants to live in our hearts so that we can sit at his table in compassionate fellowship and grace and protection. He will reveal the bigger picture to you. It starts the day that you can truly say, the Lord is my shepherd. Thank you for your time. And as we go, I would like for us to always remember that God is love and he cares for you. Just a closer walk with me. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to me.